Well, hey guys, welcome back to the Dr. Jocker's Functional Nutrition Podcast, where we really look at nutrition and our lifestyle strategies as biological information that tells our genes how to express themselves. We can express positive, healthy genetic uh, expression and, and really live our best life, or if we're not following the right principles, we can express disease and really turn on disease-causing uh, genetic traits. And so... Today, we're going to talk about keto and fasting, and I've got my friend Ben Azidi, and Ben, Ben, is that how you set, pronounce your last name, Az, Azidi or Azadi? Uh, Azadi, the second way, there you go. Azadi, there we go. Yeah. So Ben, I just recently met a few months ago, and he's just an awesome guy. He is a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner, which I found, actually, uh, have one that works for me as well. I found the FDNPs to be some of the sharpest people out there, so... Uh, so I'm not surprised that Ben uh, works as an FDNP. So he's, uh, he really gets to the root cause, does advanced lab testing to help people. And uh, he's on a mission to help 1 billion people live healthier lifestyle. And he's written three best-selling books, The Perfect Health Booklet, The Intermittent Fasting Cheat Sheet, and The Power of Sleep. And he is the founder of Keto Camp, the go-to resource for intermittent fasting and the ketogenic diet. He's known as the health detective because he investigates dysfunction and educates doesn't medicate to bring the body back to normal function. And, uh, you know, he definitely is, uh, is really, really sharp. So I'm looking forward to this conversation. We're going to talk all things keto and fasting. So Ben, welcome to the podcast. Uh, Dr. Jockers, I am so grateful to be here. I'm a huge fan of your work. So thank you for having me. Absolutely. Well, Ben, I know you've been putting out a lot of content. You've been growing fast on YouTube, which is great. Your podcast is doing great. You've got some awesome guests, and you've been helping so many people. And uh, I'd really love to hear your story, how you got into natural health. Yeah, absolutely. So for most of my life, Dr. Jockers, I was actually obese for the first 24 years of my life. Growing up with parents who uh, immigrated to Miami, Florida from Iran, they did the best they can with what they had. And my mom and dad got divorced. My mom pretty much raised me and my sister by herself. And she had three jobs. One of those jobs was an assistant manager at Kentucky Fried Chicken. (laughs) So (laughs) she would bring me home just about every single night, some Kentucky Fried Chicken. And being a kid, I ate that Kentucky Fried Chicken. And I loved KFC when I was little. Oh, my gosh. Yeah, it was my go-to. I had way too much of it. But yes, me too. So I had that food and my environment was poor and I'm a true believer that we become our environment. In my environment growing up, I was pretty much left to my own devices. And the crowd I grew up with in Miami Beach specifically, they were about bad crowd. They were doing drugs, selling drugs, playing video games all day. And I became a part of that environment and it showed with my mental appearance and also my physical, uh, my mental traits and my physical traits. So I was thinking negative thoughts. I also looked obese and I was mentally obese at the same time. This transferred into my adulthood. Uh, Fast forwarding now into 2008, 2009, I was 24 years old. And this was a pinnacle in my life because I was obese, weighing 250 pounds. And my ex-girlfriend, she broke up with me at the time. We were together for almost four years and she left me because all I wanted to do was play video games and just eat a poor diet. Hmm. And I was lost in life. And it, it was really bad to the point where I was just tired of hurting every single day. I was crying every single day. I was afraid to be in a room by myself because every time I was in a room by myself, I just, I was thinking bad thoughts and it got so bad that I would actually go on the internet several times and look for ways to end my life because I was tired of hurting. And every time I did that, I would think about my mother and I would think about what I would leave for her and it it would just stop me. And And I believe that if I didn't have my mother in my life, I would have probably ended my life because I was just so tired of hurting. And I knew at that point in my life that I was not going to take my life. I was going to fight on. I didn't know how, but I knew I was going to fight on. And this is a point in my life where books entered my life. So the books, if you're watching, you see the books Mm. behind me. Um, I started to read from the authors like Wayne Dyer and Bob Proctor and these legends out there. And it really just opened me up to a whole new world. And for the first time in my life, I took responsibility over my results or the lack thereof results. So I took responsibility I started to focus on my health. I started to do things like P90X and these beach body programs. And nine months later, I went from 250 pounds down to 170 pounds. I went from 34% body fat down to 6% body fat. So I finally carved out a physical six pack. But I tell people that more importantly than the physical six pack, I carved out a mental six pack. And that I'll take that over a physical one any 
day of the week. And that's what started my journey in the health space. Yeah, I love how you talk about that. You were mentally obese, right? And now you have you mentally have a six pack. And so, yeah, it's that transformation in our mind. I mean, I think that's really where it all starts. So yeah, that's powerful. Yeah, so let's talk about some of the strategies you use to lose weight. Um, as you got started, what did you do with your nutrition? Yeah, it's interesting because what I did back then is not what I would teach now. So mm -hmm. an important lesson for myself was that I got fit but I was one of those fit, sick people out there who had digestive issues and acne. My liver was all beat up. So what I did was uh, any kind of change would have gotten me results. So I did excessive exercise. I ate lower fat, so not keto, kind of like the opposite of keto. And I ate every two to three hours. But I was so active and my diet just changed completely that it got me results. So here I was, 170 pounds, six-pack abs, but I felt like crap. My yeah. skin was inflamed. Uh, so I wasn't healthy. Um, what I did to get healthy was, you know, experiment, ex experimenting with different avenues. And I, we could share about, about that if you want. But what I did was not what I would teach nowadays. Yeah, I would love to hear your journey because, I mean, it's so true that that strategy, if you're, if you're obese and you go down to the, uh, the low-fat diet and uh, you're doing small meals, it will work to a certain degree. And, uh, and you, can, you can definitely lose weight that way. A lot of people have, but you're not really dramatically improving your health. So I'd love to hear your journey and your progression. Yeah, exactly. So I wasn't healthy, but I was fit, or at least on the outside. But I was bloating. I had issues with my digestive system, and I knew something wasn't right. So I started to read different health books, and that's where I actually got into the vegan diet. And I read, this is before I knew how to kind of read studies and decipher what's actually legitimate versus what's not. So I read the China study. This is now back in 2012, 2013. And it convinced me that the vegan approach to plant based, 100% plants is the way to go. And I did that for. For 15 months, actually, I was strict vegan. The first few months, I felt fantastic. You know, my skin cleared up. I was performing better in the gym. My hormones felt better. And then I hit this wall. But I put myself in this dogmatic box thinking that this was the end-all diet for everybody. And it hurt me because my health suffered as a result. So now I'm 15 months into it. And I knew that I had to make a change. And this is actually when I started to get into your work. Uh, I started reading some of your stuff, Dr. Pompa. Mm -hmm. um, uh, Paul checks work. And I started getting into a higher fat, learning about a higher fat diet. You know, it wasn't necessarily called keto back then. Some people were calling it that, but they were saying eating more healthy fat, Mediterranean type of diet. So I decided to transition from a vegan diet to a ketogenic diet back in 2013, 2014. And my life just changed for the better. I started to get amazing results. I even was testing my ketones back then where it was like seven mm. bucks a, a yeah. ketone strip. And yeah. if you messed up, that's seven bucks down the drain. <laughs> <laughs> so that's what got me started into the keto space. And also I started doing fasting back then. And uh, I found these two powerful tools that I still use to this day. Yeah, absolutely. So that's such an interesting journey. So let's, let's talk about, because I know you have specific strategies now that you've been working with people. Um, you know, obviously following ketogenic diet. And I want to go into that. Actually, you know, before we do that, though, I want to talk about why you decided to become a functional diagnostic nutrition practitioner. What was the journey with that? Yeah, I, I wanted to have a certification next to my name hmm. uh, because I, I felt like it was needed when I went and I gave talks or somebody asked me, are you a, a certified health coach? Before this, I wasn't. I would just say, no, I'm somebody who just reads a whole bunch of books. And, you know, this is what I've learned from myself and from my friends and some of my clients. But I wanted to have some sort of certification. So I was looking for a certification. And I found that there's so many out there and they're not all created equal. And I came across Reed Davis's work through Sean Croxton, who had Underground Wellness. Mm -hmm. And I thought, maybe this might be a good approach for me. So I looked into it. I saw what they're about. They're about getting doing some advanced lab testing, like you mentioned earlier, and getting to kind of the root cause of what's going on. And that's resonated with me. So I decided to enroll into the course, and, and I just loved it. I just geeked out on it every single day, just wanted to absorb all the information, and then I graduated from the course. That's cool. And how many years ago did you graduate from that? That was um, th about three years ago. Yeah. I've referred a yeah. lot of people to that program. It's a really good program. Oh, yeah, cool. And you said you had somebody on your team who has been uh, certified with it. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, Michael, he actually used to work for me. So he actually used to uh, be one of my writers and health coaches, right? But yeah, he was super sharp, right? So awesome. really enjoyed working with him. And I've referred a lot of people to that program. So if you're out there and you're listening and you're looking for a health coach, FDNP is really good. Um, they have a really good program. It's good, good certification to look for. 
Uh, so let's talk a little bit about keto and how you look at keto and what are some of the benefits that somebody can get by getting their body into ketosis. Yeah, I would say that, that keto is not a diet, it's a metabolic process. Mm. And every single culture in the history of this world, as you know, were, yep. went into periods of time of ketosis because they were forced to do it. And there's a lot of benefits that go along with it. You talk all about it, especially in your new book. Uh, the, ma- the, the main things that I see, that I, the main benefits, I should say, that I, I like for keto, that I love about keto, is just my brain gets turned on. I, I know when I'm in ketosis, even without checking my glucose and ketones, I'm, I'm at the point where I don't have to do that. I just know. Um, I'm just mentally sharp. I'm able to recall things just like that. I'm able to deal with any problems that might come my way. And I can handle it and turn it into an opportunity. So I just love that mental clarity that it gives me because I know the opposite of that. When I was a pure sugar burner, I would have brain fog, I would have mental fatigue, yeah. and I wasn't as sharp. And as soon as I made that transition, oh my gosh, as an entrepreneur, it was a game changer. And I have some high performing entrepreneurs that I coach, and they want me to teach them how to get into ketosis because they know it'll just elevate their business. So that's my favorite, one of my favorite benefits of ketosis is the ketones that fuel is such a clean fuel source. And the analogy that I give is burning glucose is a very dirty fuel source. And I compare it to a Mack truck that's speeding through the highway with all of the smoke coming, coming mm. out of its exhaust pipe, right? It's not going to be healthy for the environment. It's probably not going to get to its destination safe. But when we transition and teach all 70 trillion cells to burn fat and produce ketones, that's like a Tesla cruising through the highway, cleaner for the environment. So I teach people how to convert from being a Mack truck to a clean producing uh, Tesla and the, the body loves it because we know it turns on longevity genes. It helps reduce inflammation. The byproducts that are created from producing ketones are a shorter list compared to glucose. It's a longer list. Yeah. So that's a few of my ben- favorite benefits of it. Yeah, absolutely. And that's why I follow it too. At this point in my life, it's just all about mental performance, energy, mental clarity. You get tremendous benefits by having ketones elevated in your, in your, your bloodstream. So let's talk about, I mean, there's different, you know, obviously some individuals are going to thrive being in ketosis for longer periods than others. So how do you start to differentiate that? Because, you know, what's your, your thoughts on carb cycling, uh, feasting, and really just going in and out, diet variation going in and out of ketosis? Yeah, a lot of what I teach, it's very similar to Dr. Pampa, who's my mm-hmm. coach and mentor. Um, I have my four pillar approach, which we were kind of talking off air about. Yeah. So the four pillars are uh, uh, um, adapt. So number one, getting fat adapted, teaching somebody to go from being burning sugar to burning fat. And it's a 28 day process that I teach in my keto camp academy. Mm-hmm. And then once they graduate from that, they've earned the badge, start doing some intermittent fasting. So I kind of start building them up. We start at 14 hours fasting. So that my second pillar is called fast, by the way. So 14 hours, 16 hours, and eventually we get into a 24 hour fast. Um, once we complete that, we're ready to go into the third pillar, which is called phase. Now, this pillar is about two weeks, and it's kind of strict keto, meaning very, very low carb, 10 grams or less. We're really forcing the cells to mm-hmm. only choose fat for fuel for about two weeks, short period of time. Once the person has gotten through those first three pillars, then we have my flex pillar, which I called keto flexing. Dr. Pompa might call it diet variation. You have mm-hmm. different names for it. Yeah, That's when the person could start cycling out of ketosis. And there's four different ways I teach it, but one of them is having one day out of the week where we don't, we don't do any fasting. We do high healthy carbs, kind of paleo, and we teach the body to raise insulin, to make these hormonal conversions, to remind the body that it's not starving. And if you've done the work the right way, you should be able to go right back into ketosis that next day or the day right after, because we've achieved this metabolic flexibility. Mm. There are always caveats here. Like if somebody has type 2 diabetes or they're very, they have insulin resistance, then I'll keep them in ketosis a little bit longer and work on building that before I yeah. start flexing them out. Um, there's also another caveat for, for clients or members of my academy who are ladies who have their monthly cycle. Hmm. I teach a little bit different. So the first 12 days, so once they have their period, I, I tell them, hey, you could do keto and fasting all you want. Once they hit day 12 to day 14, I actually tell them to have more high healthy carbs, less fasting to get a little bit more of a, the insulin spike for estrogen. Then day 14 to day 21, back down to strict keto and fasting. Uh, excuse me, day 14 to day 21, yeah, back down to strict keto and fasting. And then the last five to seven days leading up to the period again, we get out of ketosis to get more of that, those hormonal conversions. Mm-hmm. So there's a lot of caveats there. And it's, there's no cookie cutter approach to keto. I mean, you teach all that all the time. So that's 
in a nutshell, how I teach it. Yeah, it's really important for menstruating women, particularly when they're very lean, very thin, lean women can oftentimes struggle. And so like you were talking about, day 14 is basically ovulation and you need this whole explosion of estrogen progesterone there. And so uh, those carbs really help increase that. So uh, yeah, so there's strategic times where fasting, ketosis, strict ketosis can be really beneficial. And there's times where we need a, we need a push of insulin because insulin plays a role in the production of estrogen, progesterone, thyroid hormone that are all key there. So, uh, so really good caveats. I always tell people, it's kind of like a bell curve. You got people on one side of that bell curve, the extreme that are very insulin resistant. And those people need to stay in ketosis longer, longer periods of time. Sometimes they thrive just always being in a state of ketosis. And then you've got the other extreme on the other side that really need more feasting, right? They need that, uh, in a sense, higher carbs uh, in their diet. And you got most people that are kind of in the middle that do really, really well going in and out of ketosis on a more frequent basis. And so it seems like your, your four-phase program really is a really great program for helping people go through that process. And I, w I like the way that you've, uh, you've titled it and uh, the terminology you're using for it. It's real easy for people to grasp. What kind of results have you seen with people going through that? Yeah, well, thank you for that. By the way, you know who helped me de design it as uh, Sean Croxton. He's one of my coaches. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yeah. so he helped yeah. me. So shout out to Sean if he's listening to this. Um, amazing results, uh, David. You know, there's been members posting in the Facebook group, uh, I no longer need my insulin. I got off of this blood pressure medication. And it happens time after time after time. And one of my favorite celebrations is when they say they've broken up with their scale. You know, <laughs> the scale no longer determines yeah. whether something is working or not because it just drives people crazy. and they they focus now on non-scale victories, right? Their energy levels, their confidence, the way their skin looks. So those are some of the victories I've been seeing in there. I love it. I love it. What are some things that people should know? Like, you know, there's certain things, for example, you know, a lot of people are trying to restrict their salt consumption. And we know that when you go into ketosis, you actually reduce insulin. And so you don't, you lose more salts. So you actually need more salts. What are some other big takeaways uh, that people need to know uh, as they're trying to transition into ketosis? Yeah, that's what you just mentioned is, is a big one. The, the, the kidneys will dump a lot of water weight and your electrolytes will go along with it. With that being said, also, if you're drinking coffee, I also mm. throw in sea salt with the coffee. We know coffee is a diuretic, so that's a great yeah. way to re replenish it as you're losing it. But also what you talk about all the time, which I learned a lot from you, by the way, which is the bitters, the bitters, bitters yeah. good for the liver. You always say, I think that's the number one thing I've seen people struggle on the keto diet is they can't break down fat. You know, they're not, they don't have mm -hmm. the, the bile flow to do it because their liver has been beat up. And we know that gallbladder removal surgery has been one of the top procedures in the US. So if you don't have a gallbladder, you'll have even more of a difficult time. So eating more of the, the bitters, the lemons, the limes, you talk about the arugula, even dark chocolate, organic yeah. coffee can do it as well. Artichoke is a powerhouse. You talk yeah. about artichoke. One of my lot. favorites. Yeah. Oh my gosh. Yeah. Because it builds bile and yeah. it has fiber, right? So it's fantastic. Yeah. So uh, the bitters are going to be important. And then I think it's a good idea if you're, you're still having issues with your digestive system and processing fats on ketos, maybe you take some ox bile, take two capsules mm. of like ox bile before yeah. a meal or some apple cider vinegar 30 minutes before a meal. That'll help. But here's a missing component that I see with keto. I think with actually with every health program out there, and uh, this might sound a little woo-woo to some people, but love and gratitude. Mm. I mean, they go a long way. You could be doing yeah. keto perfectly, eating all the bitters, having the perfect fasting schedule and exercising perfectly. But if you have hatefulness in your mind, in your thoughts, resentfulness every day, yeah. You cannot heal. Dr. Will Cole says you cannot heal a body you hate, and it's so mm. true. So something that I do and I teach in my academy is to practice gratitude, practice loving yourself. Wake up in the morning and find 10 things to be grateful for. Love yourself. Look in the mirror and tell yourself you love yourself. That goes a long way. And we know, we know that stress, when you have high amounts of cortisol, what follows is glucose and insulin. And when glucose and insulin go up, ketones go down. So you can actually yes. knock yourself out of ketosis just by being stressed out with your thoughts. So I think that's the missing component right there for a lot of people. Yeah, I think that's powerful. And especially coming from you where you were basically suicidal about 10 years ago, right? You were, yeah. if it wasn't for your mom, like you said, you probably would have taken your life. And so now, and, and I don't know you very well, but we've talked a few times and you seem to be like one of the most positive people. And I think it has a lot to do with that practice right there. You're teaching people this and you know, it, it really uh, makes a huge difference. And so gratitude, uh, self-love so important. A lot of us have faced 
things like childhood trauma, right? So like uh, there's another keto influencer and uh, he just, in, in, he just uh, interviewed me on ch- childhood trauma and how that can actually play a role with restricting our ability to lose weight and really get into ketosis and get, get the health benefits that, uh, you know, that we could have had. And so, so many people have dealt with some sort of trauma, whether it was emotional trauma, maybe a divorce in the family, um, you know, maybe they were sexually abused or, you know, whatever it was. And, uh, you know, those are deep roots that really affect us, whether we're thinking, you know, typically we're not really thinking about it on a day-to-day basis, but it's deep in our subconscious and we've got to really root that out and we can retrain our, our nervous system by practices of gratitude, like you're talking about. Yeah. You said it, it's, it's in the subconscious mind. So we're not aware that it's happening, but it, but it's happening. So I've done a lot of work on myself. I've done something, uh, a program called landmark education to really mm. uncover blind spots and, and help me live powerfully and authentically. So for myself, I can only speak from experience. You're right. 10, 11 years ago, I wanted to kill myself. Now, all I want to do is, is wake up and create content. And I just yeah. love what I'm doing. So it's a whole 180. And if I could go from that dark place to what I'm doing now, I think anybody could do it as well. That's true. Anybody can. So let's talk about fasting. How do you like to practice intermittent fasting on a daily basis? Let's, let's talk about a day in the life of Ben Azadi. Yeah, I love fasting. Uh, it's my favorite thing to talk about. I know you do too. Yeah. Um, how I practice, practice it personally is I kind of do a 20-hour fasting window and a four-hour feasting window. And I say feasting yeah. intentionally. I, I, I eat a yeah. lot when I do eat. Yeah, I know. <laughs> I do too. Yeah. Right? Uh, so I do that. and uh, But I do have coffee in the morning during my fast with mm-hmm. some MCT oil and grass-fed mm-hmm. butter and sea salt. So I do a yep. fatty coffee. For me, it's not giving me a high insulin glucose spike uh, and it works for me. For some mm-hmm. people, it might give them a high glucose spike and it might not work for them. So that's important to test and know. So I usually do that. And then I'll throw in a 24-hour fast once a week. Um, I should probably throw in more days where I'm not doing any fasting but I find it kind of weird to eat breakfast nowadays. So I do make sure when I do eat, I'm feasting and probably two days out of the week. I'm, uh, well, actually, I, I, I kind of have a percentage of how long I'm in ketosis versus how long I'm not. I would say 80% of the time I'm in ketosis, 20, 20% of the time I'm not. How it works for me is that probably most of the day while I'm fasting, I'm in ketosis. But then when I feast, I'll sometimes have more carbohydrates and I'll get knocked out of ketosis if you want to call it that. But the next morning I'm right back in. So that's kind of the yeah. way I do it. But I've trained my, my metabolic machinery now to get yeah. to this point. But that's yeah. how I do it. Yeah, I have, a really, I have a really similar strategy as well. I usually do two days a week where I only eat one meal and then five days a week where I'm eating two meals. And when I eat, I bring down a lot of food. I mean, I'm talking like 1,500, sometimes 2,000 calories. Um, just really, I'm not trying to eat, you know, I'm not trying to count my calories. I'm just eating until I'm satiated. And that's so important not to try to restrict your calories. Um, especially if you were at your optimal weight, you definitely don't want to restrict calories. You want to really eat till you're fully satiated. That's just so important. So that's, you know, that, that element of, of feasting. Now let's talk about, you mentioned the coffee in the morning. What would be a sign without testing? So obviously, somebody can test their blood glucose and their ketone levels to see if the coffee is knocking them out of ketosis. What would be some other signs? Like, what, what might somebody experience if they drink coffee in the morning and that knocks them out of ketosis? Yeah, well, if you feel, feel like you've hit a plateau with the results, it could be that morning coffee. It could be the, the fats you're having in there because your body has to burn that fat before it goes to your body fat. So if you have yeah. extra weight to lose, that might be slowing down your weight loss. That could be one of them. Uh, another issue would be maybe you don't metabolize, metabolize coffee that well, or you're having yeah. it too late in the afternoon and mm. it has an eight hour half life. So you're going to bed with that still in your system and your sleep is taking a hit because of it. So there's a lot of considerations there. I, I do like the process or concept of testing your glucose if, if that's yeah. something you want to do, because it really shows you how well you're responding to it. And people ask me all the time, I'm sure they ask you too does coffee break a fast? Well, it really depends. First of all, what is your definition of breaking a fast? For me, yeah. is anytime autophagy is stopped. So yeah. autophagy was stopped whenever we get a rise in glucose. So I always tell them, oh, well, let's test your glucose before and then 30 minutes after. And I learned this from Dr. Pompa, by the way. And if your glucose goes up more than five points, then for you, it is breaking the fast. Mm. But if it doesn't, go up more than five points, then it's not breaking your fast. But the only way to know for Mm. sure is to test. Now, another thing, Ben, actually, is if your glucose drops too much, because insulin, when you release insulin, that will also stop autophagy, right? And so what what I'll also tell people with coffee is, 
if you drink coffee, you should feel amazing. Like coffee is a performance enhancement tool, right? So you should actually feel great. It should actually help you fast longer when you're drinking coffee. It should reduce cravings. If you're noticing an increase in cravings, right? You drink coffee at 7 a.m. and at like 10 a.m. You're, you're having cravings. You're kind of crashing a little bit. You know, that's feedback that your body didn't respond well to it. And you probably had a rise in either blood sugar or insulin that uh, that's then causing that that response. So that's always something that that people can uh, can look at. I've also seen some people that tend to have, even though I don't overly focus on cholesterol on a ketogenic diet, I found some people that just tend to have very high LDL at times. It's definitely not everybody, but oftentimes a food sensitivity can be a factor in that. And for some people, coffee can be a player. Oftentimes, it's just they're not they're not breaking down bile effectively or thyroid hormones. They have underconversion, but sometimes there can be a food sensitivity there too. So it's just two things to look at. Um, and I'm talking really high cholesterol, like 300, 350, 3, you know, 400. A lot of people freak out when their cholesterol is 250. Not a big issue as long as your your ratios are in order. And so uh, I talk a lot about that in my book and on my blog. But uh, just a couple things that I've seen. I'm not sure if you've you've seen anything like that as well. Yeah, I have. And it also depends on the type of coffee, right? Because we know not all yeah, coffee is created equal. True. Most of the coffee out there is sprayed with pesticides and herbicides yes. and it's ripping open people's type junction. So uh, I don't think it's more of a problem if it's like an organic shade grown coffee, but if it's the yeah. cheap stuff, people going to, you know, I'm not going to name names, but the drive through of these coffee shops and they're getting yeah. that morning, that's going to be an issue probably. Yeah. Yeah, absolutely. Yep. And then some people are just poor caffeine metabolizers. So they have to watch the dose. Doesn't mean they can't have any, but sometimes they do better with a half a cup or a quarter cup, you know, and, and so you got to watch the dose and watch the amount of caffeine. Other people, again, you know, your response to coffee should be, wow, this is amazing. I feel like this makes my whole day. I feel amazing all day. No cravings. I can go all day, work hard. If you're not responding like that, maybe an issue with how you're metabolizing it. So yeah, great point. Yep. Absolutely. So let's talk a little bit more about fasting. You know, you mentioned autophagy. So what are some strategies for people to really get the most out of that autophagy process? Yeah, well, you could do a block fast, an extended fast, um, three, four, five days. Last year, uh, 2019, I did, I took a group of 20, sometimes 30 people. Um, every 90 days, I took a group of these people and I took them from being a sugar burner. And in seven weeks, well, on week six, they all completed a five-day fast, whether it was a water fast or a bone broth fast or a fasting significant diet or some sort of partial fast. And uh, the goal was to achieve this maximum autophagy from Dr. Thomas Seafried, which is that one-to-one -one mm -hmm. ratio, glucose divided by 18 compared to the ketones. Uh, and we know that if you hit that ratio, your body is just in deep healing mode. Yeah. You're just smashing these uh, senescent cells and you're recycling cells and doing great things in the body. So that's one way to do it. However, I wouldn't recommend it for everybody. It's, it, fasting is like a muscle, and you really have to have this muscle fine-tuned and develop before you go into a block fast. So having a coach is very important. Understanding how the body works and how to test and you know signs to pay attention to is important. But you can get autophagy outside of a block fast. You can get it through um, some. So I, I I haven't seen any studies, and maybe you have, but I haven't seen what points autophagy starts during a fast. My estimation for somebody who's already keto adapted is probably around the 16 to 18 hour mark. Mm -hmm. They're starting to get some autophagy. So if you threw in 24 hour fast, a 36 hour fast, you'll get more of the autophagy. If you want to add exercise yeah. during a fast, you'll get more of the autophagy. There's also specific ingredients like resveratrol and some extracts and um, I think lion's mane that can help activate autophagy. So there's several ways to get it. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. Yeah. And I think very much like you said, uh, you have to be keto adapted. You're going to get autophagy faster. If you're very lean and keto adapted, you'll probably end up, because we just don't have enough research on that yet. Hopefully, uh, we'll be getting a lot more on when autophagy starts or really ramps up, uh, what the kind of critical threshold is. But I think it's going to range a lot for different individuals. Somebody that's very fit, very metabolically flexible, you're probably right, probably in that 16-hour range, 16 to 18-hour range. Um, and then somebody that's more insulin resistant, higher fasting insulin levels. I mean, they may need to do, you know, a three day, five day fast in order to really get that autophagy ramped up. So yeah, I think that, that that's a key factor. And like you talked about, there's definitely herbs, uh, curcumin, turmeric, green tea, extract coffee actually enhances autophagy. So, um, so you can stack those types of things while you fast 
as long as you respond well. You know, people always ask, can I drink green tea? Can I drink coffee? If you respond well, it's going to enhance autophagy. So I think that's key. Yeah, yeah, good point. And then you throw the exercise during that fast, you get even more. Yes, absolutely. Yeah, today I just finished a 24-hour fast and I worked out right at the end of the 24-hour fast before I broke my fast. And that's actually like my favorite workout is a 24-hour workout or 24-hour fast followed by a workout because I'm really running off of high levels of ketones and I need less oxygen consumption. It's like I just feel like I've got better recovery actually between sets while I'm doing that. And it's a real powerful stimulator for autophagy. So really good stuff. I love that. I do that too. I also I have my best workouts towards the end of a 24 hour fast when I work out. And that's the way to do it. If you're going to work out during the fast, you want to do it towards the end of your fast. That's You can maximize the benefits that way. Yeah, absolutely. And I always find that um, you know, at the end of the fast, I'm not hungry, but if I keep the fast going for several hours, I definitely start getting cravings. And so for a lot of people, you know, if, you're, if your goal is like a certain length of time of a fast, definitely helps to wait until towards the end before you, uh, before you work out. Yeah, agreed. Yeah. Let's talk a little bit about your keto camp, because I know this is an amazing program that you've put together. So let's talk about how that works. And uh, I know we've got a link for the, uh, for the listeners here on how they can jump in on that. Yeah, the Keto Camp Academy is just a phenomenal program. It's the best thing I've ever created. It's an online platform where you could join from anywhere in the world. It's a monthly membership where you get access to my four pillar approach that I spoke about how to practice keto, how to go A to Z keto. Even if you're advanced, we have advanced strategies for keto and fasting, but it's much, much, much more than that because we know that those are just two powerful tools in the health shed and there's so many others out there. So we talk about, there's a section called mental six pack, you know, I talked mm. about it earlier. There's so many videos on self-development and book reviews. I have special um, guests come in there and do live trainings. And I also do two group coaching calls every single month where you could ask me questions. I'll answer it for you. And our community is amazing. The keto campers are fantastic. We're supporting each other. We put you in a private Facebook group. There's uh, over 150 videos in the keto camp Academy that you cannot find anywhere else. And I'm adding new content in there every single week. It's a phenomenal program. If you are somebody who wants that guidance and we want to really learn, understand keto and fasting and take it to another level, then this might be a great approach for you. Yeah, guys, I definitely recommend it. Um, you know, most of us are going to respond better when we've got that social support, the accountability. So a great, you know, really friendly guy like Ben, who's extremely knowledgeable to help answer our questions. You know, he's got those two coaching calls every single month, lots of great videos, and just a community that's there to help support you. You're going to have questions along the way, you're going to have challenges, and it's always good to be able to connect with people that are on the journey with you and uh, get those questions answered. So absolutely, and, and we do have a link, so you can check that out, check out the link, and we've got a special offer on how to get, get going with the Keto Camp. And so, Ben, any last words of inspiration or anything else people should really know when it comes to their health journey? Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And thank you for sharing that, that the link in your, in your podcast. I appreciate that. Yeah, you know, the results that we want to create in life, whether it's with our health, business, relationships, whatever it is that's external, always starts internally. It's really with our thoughts. I believe our thoughts are our greatest power. It's, it has the power to build amazing things and create heaven or to create hell. And we actually control that. And everything starts with the thought. Uh, Bob Proctor said it best, thoughts become things. If you can see it in your mind, you can hold it in your hands. So it's going to start with you envisioning what you want to accomplish, whether it's that ideal body with the energy levels and the relationships with the business. But it really starts with you believing it before you see it. Because a lot of people think you have to see it to believe it, but it's really backwards. You got to believe it to see it. So keep your goals in front of you. Keep that vision in front of you. Whatever you want to accomplish, I believe it's so important to write down your goals. Keep your goals in front of you. I have a goal card right in front of me right here that I read every single day. I write down my goals mm. every night and my gratitude every night before bed in the morning when I wake up. And I haven't missed a day in over three years. And when you get into the habit of doing this, it's going to change your life because it's going to change your subconscious programming, the paradigms that you have been programmed the first seven years of your life. And if you are not getting the results you want in your life, then there's some things that need to be unlearned and relearned. And it all starts with your thoughts. So that's what I would leave for you today. If you want to change your life, you got to change your thoughts and you could create amazing results in your life. That's so powerful. And Ben, I want to really just acknowledge you for be for your inspiring journey. I mean, you went from again, 10 years ago, literally 
uh, thinking about committing suicide. So you were at such a low place and now transforming yourself to where you're just full of positivity and you're an inspiration. You're helping you know, hundreds of thousands of people in your, in your groups, um, really help, just helping them transform their life and their health and taking them from you know, a place where they felt helpless to a place where they're empowered and really living their best life. And so you are definitely an inspiration, putting out such great content out there that people are accessing all around the world and uh, making a huge difference with your life. And so I just want to acknowledge and thank you for everything you're doing for, for the world and uh, for the health community. Well received, Dr. Joggers, and I admire your work so much, and a lot of what I do is because of you, so thank you for the work that you've been putting out for so many years. Well, thanks so much. And last question, what are your top five foods, like if you, if you could only eat five foods for the rest of your life, what, top, what five foods could you live on? Yeah, avocados for sure, um, coconuts yeah. for sure, uh, olives, because then I can turn into olive oil if I need to, um, grass-fed beef. I love that. So I think that's four. Uh, so if I'm going off the script of keto, um, you know, Mexican cuisine is my favorite. So maybe some, ta- <laughs> some tacos would be my favorite. Some pico de gallo and oh some stuff gosh, like that. Yes, oh my gosh, yes. Yeah. So often here in Miami, I could have that, but I don't. Yeah. But that would be my go-to right there. I got, we got a lot of similarity, a lot of crossover there. So that's, oh, really? that's awesome. Oh, yeah, yeah. I love all those foods. So. Awesome. That's great, man. Well, thanks again for being on the podcast. And for all those that are listening, again, check out the link so you can check out the Keto Camp. Um, definitely, you can follow Ben. Uh, you know, you can check out his website. What's your website, Ben? Yeah, so benazadi.com. And then uh, definitely yeah. check out my Keto Camp podcast. Dr. Keto Jockers Camp. was on there yeah. a few weeks ago. Amazing right. interviews. So go, go listen to that. And then on YouTube as well. Yeah, YouTube. He's active on Instagram. So definitely check him out all over there. And uh, for those of you listening, remember, your life is way more valuable than, than you think it is. So go out, take action, and live your best life. We'll see you soon. Be blessed.